Well, welcome everybody. I'm Glenn Ruga, the founder and director of the Social Documentary Network. And thank you for being here today to engage in a discussion about one of the most trying events of our lifetimes. The focus of SDN has always been to promote documentary photography as a parallel means to understand pressing global issues. The visual image uses different nerve receptors than what we use when we speak, hear, and read. And these receptors are de deeply embedded in our DNA as a human species. But it is not one or the other. With SDN, we've always insisted on combining both the visual images and the written or spoken word, which really support each other. A little over two years ago, we organized a similar program about another trying event with photographers Ed Cashy and Susan Micellis to discuss the, the global pandemic and what it means for image makers. This was only weeks after the lockdown went into effect and we were in uncharted waters, in fear, seeing sickness and death all around us with no indication as to where this would go. But one thing was certain, it was the furthest thing from our minds that more than two years later, the pandemic would still be with us. But it is, we've learned to live with it only because we have no other choice. Today, we're now experiencing another cataclysmic event that rivals the pandemic. This is not a virus, but rather a deliberate destruction of a sovereign and democratic nation by a madman. At last count, 13 million people have been driven from their homes. It is too soon to know the casualty figures, but we've seen evidence of war crimes and President Biden has called this a genocide, the greatest crime known to humanity. We've seen the massive destruction of civilian lives and in infrastructure. We've become familiar with faraway places with unfamiliar names such as Bucha, Erpin, Mariupol, Zaporizhia, Kharkiv, Kherson, names that now have the gravity of places such as Srebrenica, Sarajevo, Vukovar, Kigali, Tualsleng, Babi Yar, Auschwitz, Verdun, and too many others. We're fortunate to have with us here today two people who can help us make sense of this nonsensical situation. Marini Staub, a photographer who just returned after spending nine weeks between Moldo Moldova and Ukraine photographing the plight of civilians throughout southern Ukraine, will show us what this war means to ordinary people. And Eric Schmidt, a New York Times writer who just this re week received his fourth Pulitzer Prize. And congratulations, Eric and has been a frequent commentator on MSNBC since the war in Ukraine started in late February. We see on the daily news the carnage being played out in Ukraine on a scale we have not seen in our lifetimes. Growing up during the Cold War, I thought I would see a nuclear holocaust before I would see Russian tanks invade a neighboring country in Europe. Did I live in a bubble my entire life, believing that naked aggression of the worst type- Len, we can't hear you. I'm sorry. Um, can people hear me? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Somebody can hear you. Yep. All right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll continue. Still cannot hear you. Um, John, it might be your end. No. Other people say they can hear me. Um, I'm going to have to mute you, John. Other people are saying they're hearing me fine. John, can you hear someone else? He can't hear anybody. Right. Send him a message. Barbara, can you send him a message through chat? All right. Did I live in a bubble my entire life, believing that naked aggression of the worst type was no longer an option among nations? Hardly. A similar aggression happened, but on a smaller scale in Bosnia when Serb nationalists laid siege to this small nation and drove nearly 2 million people from their homes and 150,000 people died, mostly civilians. I hoped it was an aberration, but Putin has taught us that it isn't and that we must remain vigilant. Lest I forget that the US is no less guilty for our crimes in Vietnam and Iraq, but I say to myself, at least we can protest, we can demonstrate, criticize and vote. Photographers and writers tell us the truth, regardless of what our government says. Russians today no longer have such privileges. Before I introduce our speakers, just a few housekeeping things. 
This event is being recorded and will be posted to the SDN YouTube channel in a few days. The chat is open. We encourage people to chat and also just to say hi and let say us, hi and let us know, where know where you're Zooming from. You're zooming from. Um, I'm hearing I'm some bad hearing feedback all of a sudden. I don't know why that is. Um, okay, we will have a Q&A at the end. And the preferred way to ask a question is to use the raise your hand button in the reactions section at the bottom of your Zoom channel. And then we'll call on people in the order that they uh, raise their hands. Um, and this event is co-sponsored by Digital Silver Imaging and the Foundation for Systemic Change. Our first speaker is Marini Staub, a frequent contributor to SDN and to Zeke Magazine. And a small collection of her photos from Ukraine appear in the current issue of Zeke Magazine now available from the Zeke Magazine website. And this just um, came off the presses recently. Um, most of the focus of this issue is on sustainable solutions to the climate crisis, but we do have a small section on Ukraine with Marini's photographs. Marini has just returned to the US after nine weeks in Moldova and Ukraine, documenting the effects of the war on civilians. Her work has brought her to Odessa, Mykoliv, Chernihiv, Kyiv, and other cities. Marini is an independent photographer and videographer. Her work focuses on human rights and social justice issues, displacement, and the effects of conflict. A 2020 Pulitzer Center Reporting Fellowship recipient, Marini is also a proud alumni of the Eddie Adams Workshop, winner of the 2019 Best of Photojournalism Emerging Vision Prize, and the first recipient of the Ed Kashi Fellowship at the Newhouse School of Communications at Syracuse University. And SCS is, is grateful to generous donors who have supported Marini's work while she was in Moldova and Ukraine. Marini, I now turn this over to you. Can everyone hear me okay? Uh, yes, I can. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and hopefully that works. Okay, go to the beginning. That would be the wrong one. That's the presentation I gave yesterday. All right. Let's see if I can do both at the same time. All right. So first of all, a big thank you to Glenn and to SDN and to everyone that um, contributed and helped support some of my work while I was over in Moldova and in Ukraine. I, my intention today is to run through what was my perspective after spending two months uh, on the ground. A lot happened throughout the country and throughout the bordering countries. And so my intention is to share images and then some anecdotes from the people I met, what I saw, what I experienced and insights I had. I'm gonna to try to keep it to around 20 minutes so that we can hear from Eric and then also allow for time um, at the end. So- Can you go full screen, please? Yes, I absolutely will. I have this desire to like, I still have uh, Zoom up, so, but I will never not be able to see any of you while I present. So somebody set up a red flag if something goes wrong. Um, so by way of a little bit of an introduction, I decided to go into Moldova versus Poland. Uh, at the outset, you know, I decided, I saw a lot of reporting starting to come out of Poland and that made sense because the most, the highest number of refugees were going into Poland. But I was very interested in what was happening in the South because Moldova is a small, poor, small, poor country and the highest number of refugees per capita were actually going into Moldova. So this first set of images is from the Polanka border crossing. I arrived in early March and floods of people were coming into Moldova across again, the Polanka border. It was primarily women and children. You may know this, but um, you know I've covered other refugee crises, but this is the first one that has been predominantly, if not predominantly women and children because all Ukrainian men ages 18 through 60, uh, with very few exceptions, uh, have to remain in Ukraine to either fight or to otherwise serve. And so what was happening, and this is a good image to represent it is people were, either taking buses or cars to the border and then walking across, or some, some were able to drive across. The first flood of um, refugees 
were those that usually had the means to drive their own vehicles across. Others were coming to the borders later on that um, you were generally seeing pe more, people more desperate for, for, for aid, for rides. So this particular bus was where people was a bus that Moldovans had driven to the border. They'd wait at the border crossing, fill it with women and children that had come and then drive these individuals back to shelter in Ishnau. It was freezing cold when I first arrived um, and hundreds of people would be amassed waiting for rides at the border on both sides. You may have heard the stories where people were waiting um, for upwards. Uh, in Poland, the wait was several days long. Um, in, at the Polanka border crossing, it could be upwards of 10 hours, plus or minus, depending upon the day. The other thing that I did, um, I was based out of Kishna, which is the capital of Moldova, for the first month, plus or minus. And what we, what I would do, um, I was doing evacuations with uh, a group called Team Humanity, and we, we would start in Kishna in the early morning hours. I think I missed a slide, but in the early morning hours, and we go in with a caravan of buses. And this image is a very simple image, but what this is, I remember standing there and they used yellow tape to write this across the, the front and the sides of the bus and it says children. And we, it was put there in the hope that um, if it was seen by a, a Russian aircraft, uh, they would choose not to bomb. And so this is what we see. This is the city of Nikolai. This is a city still under siege. And it would be, I did numerous evacuations runs and it was always to, uh, it was essentially like a, a shopping, a shopping center parking lot and hundreds of, again, primarily women and children or men who were there to say goodbye to their loved ones and soldiers that were there to say goodbye to their loved ones would be gathered waiting for people to come into Ukraine to help them get back out. Tight space was tight, and people, when they say like people have fled their homes with what they can carry, that is, that is actually very literal. Everyone left um, with a, a bag or two. Uh, this young woman, um, I remember her story because it would give such a good, uh, it's such a good example of just these these individuals are are just like just just like us. She shared with me that. The week prior, she had been shopping for her prom dress with their friends, and now she was fleeing the country. The, I mean, the, the suffering, uh, one could go on about the suffering um, the, and but the amount of pain and the family separation and everyone's was uh, most of the women and children were when I asked them like what their concerns were like they had all left their their brothers their sons their fathers behind and so there was the pain um, of leaving your home and really not knowing what would happen but also having to leave um, leave family members behind. And so these, I was talking to someone earlier about like logistics and um, the, the trip, you know, without a, with a, with a war not going on might take eight, nine hours, like to drive all the way there and all the way back. But on the way back, this is an image of um, the line to get from Ukraine back into Moldova. So we would leave in the early morning hours and then um, most trips would take 18, 19, one trip took 26 hours um, for us to go from Kishnau to Nikolai to get people to come back um, to Kishnau and, and deliver them safely to a shelter. And most of that holdup occurred at the border. This is a man named Salam and he's returning passports to everyone because what would happen at the border is um, we, we'd have to stop and everyone's documents would be checked. So this would take minimally like three, four, five hours. And this image I think was like 
two in the morning, plus or minus. And this is one of many churches in Chisinau. And so I can speak, I spend so much time in Moldova, Moldova I can speak specifically to that, but like, uh, I understand it to be similar in all the border countries, like shelters, there was a stadium, which I'll share in a few moments, but this is just an old church where like people would arrive after, you know, like 20 hours with their bag and um, they would, we would leave them in a church basement and people there would, um, would help them with immediate needs. And, and in, in the most ideal situations, they'd be able to stay there until they knew like what next. And that's a big factor, like the uncertainty of like what is gonna happen. A lot of people thought the war would, or the conflict like that, they, they didn't, no one knew, but everyone was hopeful they'd be able to soon return home. And this woman, um, she, she, her, her home had hit, been hit by a shell the week prior. And that was like the deciding factor of what made her want to leave. She, what's been really interesting is to be able to stay in touch with people. Her and her son sent me a message via WhatsApp. She was able to get um, advanced medical care in Germany. They're safely in Germany. This is the Menez Sports Center. This is a shelter um, that was primarily for Roma, Roma individuals. Um, again, in Kishnau. Uh, the Romans, as many of you might know, are a minority population in, in much of the world. And the, the shelter was um, substandard compared to the other shelters. There are also shelters that allowed animals. A lot of people you might've seen, there's been folks that have put together different photo essays, but this one allowed cats. So I had the opportunity to work with World Central Kitchen, which they're a large international organization. Some of you may have heard of them, but they provide food on the front lines. They either go and set up their own kitchens or they fund local restaurants, um, thereby helping to fuel the economy. And these are some images of just like the heroic effort it takes for whatever um, receiving country to feed what is now, like Glenn said, well, I think it's around six, it's six million plus or minus people that have become refugees and another near eight million, I think, you know, the numbers are changing daily that are internally displaced. But um, these individuals were all being fed by different restaurant partner restaurants that were delivering meals to the shelters, trying to ensure that these individuals, um, you know, in addition to everything else they were having to endure, were able to have at least a hot meal. What was inspired, and amidst everything else, what was inspiring to witness was just um, how many people like stepped up to the proverbial plate. People were doing what they could, whether they were volunteering to peel potatoes, whether they were medics, whether they were driving to the border every day to drive people back as part of the transportation, whether they were, um, you know, just volunteering at the refugee center to play with kids. Um, I've interviewed a. I interviewed probably hundreds of people and just everyone explained how like they were trying to quote, do their part. It's a heroic effort. That in addition to medical care, which I saw less of, but just if you think about all of the things that we have easily accessible without really considering it and on a daily basis, and just imagine leaving with, you're allowed one bag and then in a foreign place where you may or may not speak the language, may or may not know anyone, may or may not have like the financial means just being completely reliant on other people. This woman is, um, she really impacted me and it's just, Glenn wanted me to share some anecdotes. So I tried to pull a few people's story. Her name is Nadia. She's 68 years old and I met her at a shelter and we're still in touch. Um, she's former KGB um, and she had five sons uh, and a husband and three sons and one husband uh, died in a ship, died on a ship years ago. And then her other two sons died in 2014 and she was displaced from Odessa. So the number, like, you know, everyone has a story and that's it's rather cliche to say, but that 
is what I attempt to do. Like, um, I'm only including anecdotes from a, a few individuals here, but her story was her sense of loss. And yet, um, just to see her, um, her, her capacity to, to continue on and her generosity. And she also has, um, she also has one leg, um, just a powerful woman, one of many. So this next section, I wanna go through, I'm gonna to try to speed it up just a little bit. I, I went up to, I went to Chernihiv, which is near Bucha and Irpin. And this gives you an idea of how some this, how fortified Kiev is and how difficult it is to get around. There, we went through 30 plus or minus checkpoints just to get to this one city. And these, these are, so these are more roadblocks and they're just meant to be obstacles in case Russia makes it into this area. And then the checkpoints at every single checkpoint, we'd have to show documentation. So Chernihiv is a city in the North that was 70% destroyed. And this is probably the most destruction, yeah, 70%. So it's definitely the most destruction that I saw. And we were there two days after the city was liberated by Russian forces. So to experience the, the sh like we were witnessing the shock of residents seeing the destruction for the first time. The stories here are similar to much of what you've heard in Bucha and Irpin where residents, some residents lived in a basement for five weeks. And the destruction was total. This was a bridge destroyed, and these are Ukrainian forces helping our um, bus across a makeshift bridge that had been destroyed. Landmines. So Russia, when when they left, when they retreated from Chernihiv, they left behind landmines. So these are still active landmines. These are anti-tank landmines. They're huge. In theory, if I stepped on one, it wouldn't go off. Um, they're meant for vehicles. I did not test that. Um, and there were also anti-personnel landmines um, on the ground, which is, I mean, it's terrifying, but it's also, to me, it's, even though I was there, it's still surreal just to, just to see, because they are, I mean, deadly to say the least and very destructive. And one of the biggest issues, and some of you probably know this, you've, um, like there, if you think about like Vietnam and Laos and if these go missing or if they're not, you know, um, located and um, detonated or taken away immediately, these will become issues, you know, years after the war ends. They remain active unless detonated or otherwise diffused. Marini, are these mines laid by the Ukrainians or the Russians? No, these are these are the Russians. Like when they when they retreated, they left these behind, which is. Um, you can choose the word you want to use. But that is the intention is obviously to, to cause as much death and destruction even after they've left. And so this was a hospital we visited and the hospital, like the outside of the hospital was riddled with bullet holes and was mostly destroyed. And most people, most of the patients had been evacuated that morning, but in the basement was a bomb shelter. And, um, I will never forget, I mean, there's people you, uh, I try to remember everyone, but Bogdan, um, his, his entire family was killed and he didn't yet know that. Uh, he's in a state of shock. Um, and he, he and a few other patients were unable to leave the hospital because they had imminent surgery. Um, he's only 13 years old. Um, children's artwork in the, in the child's wing in the hospital. And this is Yelena. Um, like one thing I've, I've, I've given similar talks before, not about Ukraine, but one thing I point out is like, you, the look in children's eyes, you don't see that in like in the US or I don't. Um, and like, they're, they're not, they're just like the Trump, the way I think about it, and again, I'm not a, a psychologist, is like the, the effects of this war here are just being felt for those that are, those, for those that have survived. Like the trauma in, 
the trauma for those that have been displaced and or physically hurt or otherwise affected is, is especially for the children. And to me, this is just, it depicts resilience, like the woman in her slippers, like her decision, like in spite of everything that I showed you in Chernihiv, this woman is still walking with whether it, what it, whatever it is, her bike and her groceries, like the, the capacity for people to continue on um, no matter what. This will be the last series of pictures. I spent the last, um, last three weeks in Odessa between Odessa and Nikolaev, which are both southern port cities. You may have heard um, about them in the news most recently. Odessa was hit uh, on the 10th, which was Tuesday. Um, and, for, and, and Nikolaev is the city that has no running water. They've been without water since I believe it's April 12th. And so to me, like Odessa is this crazy visual and otherwise juxtaposition where daily life is continuing for those that have remained. And yet the entire city is fortified with sandbags and barricades. And yet I would talk to my parents and they, they were concerned as parents might be. And I'm like, people are walking, people are doing their grocery shopping, people are walking their dogs. Everyone, the people that have left have left for the most part. And those that I've talked to, like you've might have heard of like people are talking about the resilience and the grit of the Ukrainians and a lot of people are like we're, we're staying and that's what I saw visually a lot in Odessa and this is a this is a monastery and I included this because the um the elderly and the disabled are have been unable to leave and so this monastery um, this man is not, his name is Ivan. He's 91 years old. He was delightful, um, but he was, he's alone and he was unable to leave. And he, and I think they had like 110 people plus approximately um, that had been living elsewhere. And now this monastery was caring um, for this population of elderly folk, individuals that, that couldn't leave and didn't have anyone else. Irina is another one. In, the, in Odessa, Odessa is still like, Odessa is not safe, but this is this group of people have had come from Kherson, which is a, a Russian occupied and it's a city and the surrounding villages are still being hit. So Odessa at the same time that it is fortifying itself against what many think might be an imminent attack um, is receiving uh, their own displaced um, New individuals, populations. So this is within a shelter and a resource center where people are going to get food and to get a hot meal and to decide whether to stay in Odessa or get transported out outside the city. This is inside the same resource center. And the last few photos, this is in Odessa. So again, it, while Odessa is trying to protect itself and its own citizens, this is all water for Nikolaev, which is a city a few hours away, which has been without any running water for just about a month now. And I was there for a few days and it's, I mean, in addition to the hardships of war, it's, it's I mean, I, I was fine, but like it is a struggle to, to survive and to certainly with any degree of comfort without running water um, for a few days, let alone a month, in addition to constant bombings. I wanted to include audio um, and maybe I should have, but I definitely can, can maybe pull it up. But uh, in Odessa and in Nikolai, the air sirens are near constant, at least several times a day. So I guess I talk about the stress and the trauma, not to mention the actual danger, but to have that going on in daily life. And this just gives you, this was all throughout Nikolai. People were at different water points trying to get um, clean water. And this is a hospital. So imagine like, okay, it's inconvenient. You can't shower, but what about hospital facilities? What about places that need water in order to provide real care? This is, uh, Nikolai has been hit Numerous times, several hundred people have died in different parts of the city. Russians have been attacking hospitals, shopping centers. Point is not military uh, facilities. This was, I believe, a residential building. 
I include his this picture because this man told me that, you know, he's 61, he could have left. He's volunteering with World Central Kitchen and said, I interviewed him and I asked him why. And it took him about 90 seconds before he completely broke down. He is Georgian from the country of Georgia. And he said that he, he, he long story short is he's staying because he saw what the Russians did in Georgia. And he felt like it was his obligation to stay. And this is just them getting food together. One more, like I've, Yvonne, I think it was, um, served in the territorial defense, which is the military in 2014. Now he's a volunteer taking food into some of the hardest hit and most dangerous areas. And this is the last slide. This was an area where 12 people were killed last month. And um, it's just the juxtaposition of people still, some have a choice, some don't, of um, continuing to live uh, in, in a war zone, but it's still an active war zone. So I want to pass this over to Eric. I don't, Eric, no, Eric, I don't know if you have a slideshow. Let's see. Yeah, I'm gonna say a few words uh, to introduce Eric first. But thank you, Maroney, that was extraordinary. Thank you for uh, doing this work and for bringing these photos back for us with your stories. I really appreciate it. Um, our next speaker is Eric Schmidt, a senior writer with the New York Times covering terrorism and national security. Since 2007, he's reported on terrorism issues with assignments to Pakistan, Afghanistan, North Africa, Southeast Asia, among others. Eric has shared four Pulitzer Prizes. In 1999, he was part of a team of New York Times reporters awarded the Pulitzer for covering the transfer of sensitive military technology to China. In 2009, he was part of a team of New York Times reporters awarded the Pulitzer Prize for coverage of Afghanistan and Pakistan. In 2007, 2017, he was part of a Pulitzer team that examined how Russian President Vladimir Putin projects power openly and covertly. And just this week, he was awarded his fourth Pulitzer for courageous and relentless reporting that exposed the vast civilian toll of US-led airstrikes, challenging official accounts of American military engagements in Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan. Eric is also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and he is an advisor to the Foundation for Systemic Change. Eric, I invite you to make sense of what we've just seen with Maroney's photos and what this war means for us today and into the future. Well, well, thank you, Glenn, and thank you to SDN for inviting me to join the panel. And, and, and most of all, thanks to Maroney for just her remarkable and remarkably moving uh, presentation there. It's just, uh, I have colleagues who are on the ground in conflict zones and have worked with them in places like Iraq and Afghanistan and Somalia. And it's just uh, absolutely courageous uh, what she's doing in uh, bearing witness to the struggles that the Ukrainian people are going through right now uh, and underscoring both the trauma that they're experiencing and suffering through, but also their resilience. And I thought your, your, uh, your photographs, Marini, just uh, I think epitomize that so well uh, this this uh, terrible tragedy that's befallen uh, the country of Ukraine and it's some 44 million people that we're seeing right now. Uh, as Glenn mentioned, I'm a national security reporter for the Times. I'm based in Washington, D.C. Uh, I have not yet been to Ukraine. Uh, I've, uh, over the last several years, been reporting from countries around Ukraine uh, in the Baltics and Eastern Europe that were concerned about uh, the very kind of invasion that we saw Russia launch on February 24th. And uh, I think Maroney's photographs really kind of track uh, what we've been doing here in the Washington Bureau of the Times uh, in working closely with our colleagues on the ground uh, in trying to document the, the policy, first of all, the run up uh, to the war and anticipating whether uh, Vladimir Putin would actually, uh, would actually order an invasion into the country, which a lot of people didn't think would happen. Um, uh, sadly, of course, uh, we were, I think we were proven wrong, those who were hoped there could have been uh, a war could have been averted. And now we're, uh, we're into uh, basically the third month of a grinding campaign that I think Maroney's photographs uh, document so well, uh, the destruction of, of places, uh, suburbs around Kyiv, places like Bucha, 
uh, Irbun and those places like that. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's interesting that I don't think we would have been able to see the kind of photographs that Marini was able to present to us because uh, most intelligence officials here in the United States and in Western capitals, and dare I say, even possibly in Ukraine, at least in some quarters, thought this, can, this war would be over very quickly. Uh, certainly that was the official assessment of the CIA and others, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, that uh, the, the uh, much larger, technologically superior Russian military would roll into Kyiv, maybe seize the capital within about 72 hours, and then take a good chunk of the country probably the eastern part of the country in another week or two. Um, and what we've seen is a very different story, obviously. Uh, the first several weeks uh, revealed uh, how I think many of us, certainly those in the intelligence community, vastly overestimated uh, the Russian military's capability, but at the same time, greatly underestimated uh, the resourcefulness and savviness, not only of the Ukrainian military, kind of a plucky military, but its, uh, its people and the way this has really been a national effort uh, to push back, uh, to repel at least this initial invasion, forcing the Russians to withdraw their forces from Northern cities like Kyiv and Cherniv and other places that Marini uh, witnessed. And so we can, uh, that Ukrainians and other uh, you know, human rights groups and other NGOs can go in and document uh, the carnage that was there and some of the atrocities, of course, uh, that, have been, that have come through in, in Bucha. Uh, we're now in a, a second phase of the, of the war. We're tracking closely. Uh, that has been going on now for several weeks. Uh, the, the, sh the fighting has shifted kind of from the north, mostly to the east in the area called the Donbass, uh, as well as the south, uh, south and southeast along the Black Sea, uh, where the Russian forces uh, barely battered and uh, suffering from serious morale issues, logistical problems. Uh, command issues. They've lost about a dozen generals at the front who've been killed, uh, trying to regroup uh, in a different part of the country in this more wide open area. If the first part of the campaign, if you think of it as uh, more, more of an urban campaign, a fight, if not in the cities itself, certainly in the suburbs around the cities in the north, uh, this, this is more wide open. It's been described to me as almost uh, in some areas of fighting like the plains of Kansas uh, in this Donbass area. And thus, the, uh, the kind of fighting has shifted uh, from closer combat, uh, where you had the Ukrainians uh, swarming armored columns of Russian tanks and armored vehicles with their um, Javelin anti-tank missiles. You're now seeing a, a really a battle of artillery, of dueling artillery, long range fires. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, the battles that we're seeing right now. And, and sadly, it's, um, it's right now in the assessment of intelligence officials who testified as recently as uh, yesterday uh, to Congress, uh, it's uh, grinding into what appears to be a stalemate uh, that neither the Ukrainians are winning nor the, the Russians. The Russians have made some incremental progress in the East. Uh, they still have not been able to secure that Southeast coast uh, that would create a land corridor or a land bridge, if you will, between the the Donbass area in the east and the Crimea Peninsula in the south, uh, which has been one of Vladimir Putin's primary strategic objectives. Um, the other thing that we saw this week, we thought we might see a turning point. Monday was May 9th, which is the traditional victory day in, uh, in Russia, in Moscow, where they have a giant parade to commemorate uh, the Russian and allied defeat of the Nazis in World War II. A lot of people thought that uh, Putin would use this opportunity both to declare at least a partial victory, claim victory somewhere, some means, and also to uh, perhaps announce a full-scale mobilization, a full-on war, if you will, and not just the special military operation that he continues to call uh, this invasion. Uh, neither one of those happened, and so we're kind of left wondering a little bit about what Putin's uh, goals still are. Uh, he is, his army is still uh, having problems on the battlefield. They've changed commanders. They've tried to streamline their command, streamline the focus uh, to continue to aim, have the aim being at least the Donbass. Uh, Putin talks about wanting to continue to push on uh, across the southern swath of, uh, of, uh, of, of Ukraine into close to Moldova, where Marini made her uh, kind of en entered in and left through the country. That just seems inconceivable right now, just given how battered the, uh, the Russian army are, is and how difficult it's been for them to uh, scrape together the kind of reinforcements 
that can be effective fighters on the ground. Obviously, Russia still has a lot of firepower to bring to bear here. And that's one reason why I think we saw some of the top US officials, including Avril Haines, the Director of National Intelligence, uh, talking about in her testimony, warning of a prolonged conflict in Ukraine as, Ukraine, as Russia seeks uh, its continued expansive territorial gains beyond the Donbass to include that land bridge I mentioned before uh, on Ukraine's Black Sea coast. But, uh, but Ms. Haynes also cautioned that Putin uh, really struggled to achieve these, these goals now without a large scale mobilization uh, that he hasn't yet to announce or a draft, which he appears uh, reluctant to do politically. Uh, again, he's been able to sell this to the Russian public as a special military operation. Uh, clearly, it hasn't gone his way. He, uh, he continues, however, to, main, to control or have a tight grip on the narrative inside of Russia and the Russian media, uh, continue to portray uh, Ukraine and its uh, you know, U.S. and other allied backers as the aggressors, as uh, basically a Nazi-filled country uh, still, uh, that Russia is the, is the, is, is the country that's uh, the one that's been uh, aggrieved and, uh, and Russia will prevail ultimately. And so far this narrative is held, although we see signs that it's chipping away uh, as, the, as the bodies come back to Russians. Uh, by, by most Western counts, uh, 15,000 uh, Russian dead. Ukrainians say that total may be even double that. Uh, they've lost huge chunks of their military. Uh, it's down to about 75% combat effectiveness in the field right now. Um, but just as Putin uh, seems to be bearing down and showing no signs of wanting a, a diplomatic off-ramp, uh, President Zelensky of Ukraine too seems quite emboldened by the battlefield victories, the very unexpected victories, I think, and the, the resilience of the public, the public support he has not only in Ukraine, but in many corners of the globe, not all of course, uh, you still have very prominent backers of, of, of the Kremlin in places like China and India and Brazil, major countries uh, that will be able to slip through sanctions uh, to continue to support in one way or another Russia's war machine. But Zelensky himself, and I think the, the Ukrainian public, uh, are uh, I, I think they're girding for the long haul here. Uh, they know this is a battle. Uh, certainly it started off as an existential threat to their country. Uh, they still see it that way. It's still a country that's, uh, their military is much smaller still uh, than the Russian military, uh, but they now have the full-throated backing of the United States and other Western countries who've been pouring in advanced weaponry, uh, long-range artillery, uh, you know, more Stinger uh, anti-aircraft missiles, more of the Javelin missiles, uh, in systems that help knock down the Russian artillery as it comes in. Uh, you also have the United States United States helping provide intelligence that enables, uh, enables the Ukrainians to move quickly. They're much more nimble military, uh, obviously fighting on their own turf, which they know so well. Uh, they're highly motivated forces because they're defending their homeland, unlike the largely conscript army that Russia has fielded, uh, who weren't told they were gonna be invading Russia, uh, who really have no sense of why they're fighting inside of uh, Ukraine, according to the interviews that I understand have been conducted uh, by prisoners taken by the Ukrainians. And so it's um, <clears throat> in many ways uh, a real will of uh, a war of wills, uh, not only on the battlefield, which so far the Ukrainians are winning, but at the most at the highest strategic level uh, between uh, Presidents Putin and Zelensky. And I think now you see uh, signs that the Ukrainian public uh, believe that not only can they perhaps, you know, hold off the Russian military, but there are signs that they believe uh, their military can win. And by win, that means, it, you know, defining at least pushing them back to the borders uh, that existed on February 24th when this invasion started. Um, and perhaps even beyond that, pushing them out of the Donbass altogether, and even a more difficult task, maybe pushing them off the Crimea Peninsula. I, I think at least initially that goal would be unrealistic. Certainly the Crimea Peninsula, it's a, it's a Russian base, heavily fortified, that would be difficult. But I think as we're seeing this, uh, this fight slog along, I think we're unfortunately gonna see a lot more scenes of the kind of, of, of images that, that Maroney portrayed in cities across the East and the Southeast. Uh, fortunately, much of central Ukraine and the West has been spared. 
Uh, they have come under uh, rocket and missile attacks. I think as Marini's photo showed Odessa, uh, the, the kind of the last major city uh, that Ukraine holds on the, on the Black Sea coast uh, is, uh, is fallen under ex intensive missile and rocket attacks, uh, both land attack missiles, air, uh, air launch missiles, as well as those from the sea. And I think, um, I think that's what we're gonna see right now is that Russia will continue to terrorize really Ukrainian cities as far away as Odessa and Lviv in the West, perhaps even Kyiv, the capital from time to time, as they try and grind out a, uh, a war of attrition in Donbass and perhaps even push beyond that. It's, um, it's very difficult to tell right now how this war is going to end. Uh, I think both sides uh, feel that this is a crucial time for them to push hard, that they have, they both feel they have certain kinds of advantages uh, Putin's army feels they're now uh, on, a, on a, the terrain is actually placed to their military strengths, but the Ukrainians feel they have the momentum and that they have the full support of the West behind them right now with weapons pouring in, uh, with Western trainers helping uh, them train on new NATO type, NATO standard uh, weapons. And they feel uh, they can not only hold their own, but kind of push back now. So sadly, as, as we've seen, I think in many conflicts in, over the decades, it may be, take uh, weeks or months more fighting for both sides to, to more or less exhaust themselves or at least exhaust themselves uh, to seriously consider kind of diplomatic uh, initiatives, which right now really haven't gone anywhere, haven't really been serious, particularly on the, uh, on the Russian side. And so I think until we see that, um, and I think we see the casualties mount on both sides and sadly the destruction uh, that Marini uh, documented so well in her photos, I'm afraid we're in for kind of a long haul uh, through the summer and perhaps into the early fall. Uh, we saw the, uh, the United States has, has committed firm support just last night. The House of Representatives uh, passed a $40 billion emergency package. It's a combination of, of military assistance and humanitarian assistance and other aid uh, to Ukraine. It's one of the rare uh, feats of bipartisanship in this uh, political environment that we're seeing now, uh, where you have Republicans and Democrats coming together uh, and basically even adding more money to what the Biden administration was, uh, was advocating for here. So for now, uh, the political parties that are at war here in the United States have, have kind of put their differences aside uh, to fully support uh, the Ukrainian effort. Uh, there's some exceptions, of course, particularly on the, uh, the Republican side. I think there's some who are still questioning whether why the United States has a role in Ukraine right now. What's the future uh, look like in terms of American support over time? And we can certainly get into that in the Q&A Q if people want. But, um, but sadly, I think uh, is in inspirational, I think, is the Ukrainians have been on the field and certainly with Zelensky's speeches, uh, rallying his country and rallying the world to their cause, uh, I'm afraid we're in for uh, months more of kind of carnage and death and the suffering that we've seen in, in Marini's vivid photographs. Um, and, uh, and hopefully we can pay attention to this, bear witness to it, and keep pushing, uh, keep pushing toward the causes that uh, will support the Ukrainians on the ground. Um, just wanted to thank you again for, for having me on this uh, presentation. Look forward to a discussion after this. Right. Well, thank you, Eric, uh, for this sobering assessment of what we could expect to see in the future. Um, if people would like to ask questions, please use the raise your hand button, which you can find in the reaction section of the bottom of your Zoom window, and we'll call on you in the order received. Um, for both Marini and Eric, please um, just raise your hand to ask a question. Um, Eric, I'd just like to start out by asking um, a few Chris questions. And the first is fairly technical. What is the total number of combat troops in the Russian military and what percent or how many have been in Ukraine? Do you know that answer? Well, it kind of depends on how you measure this. I mean, if you, if you measure all the possible conscripts and others that they could be drafted, it's, it's an army well that could, well, I think over 800,000. That's not what's readily available though to Putin right now. Uh, he's got, uh, he brought to bear, you know, a good portion of his uh, kind of combat ready troops, about 75 to 80 percent were dedicated to this fight. And remember, they're having the Russian troops based along its borders all the way in the Far East uh, with China up into the, uh, the eastern portion with the Baltics. 
Uh, so he committed a good chunk of his most battle-tested forces, and they, they got shredded, some of the most elite units uh, in the first several days, in fact, uh, because of this lack of coordination between the uh, Russian air, ground, uh, air, land, and sea forces, uh, you know, really left themselves exposed. And so this is part of the problem, and it's why you've seen reports that he's having to, Putin's having to rely on, uh, on mercenaries from Syria, uh, from Syrian fighters themselves, uh, maybe even trying to pull the Belarusians in. So far, they've been uh, able to hold off uh, on getting directly involved in the fight, even though they're right next door and obviously helped Russian forces stage from the initial invasion. Uh, but right now, you know, unless Putin wants to mobilize hundreds of thousands of additional conscripts, and take some months to train them, uh, he doesn't have a ready reserve of really combat tested forces to throw into the fray. And that's one of the, what's one of the challenges his generals are facing right now. Well, good, I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that, that he doesn't have those reserves ready. All right, we have quite a few questions from the audience. I'll start out with John Benigna. John, if you could unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, uh, I have quick questions, one for Eric and one for Mar Marine. Eric, are there any evidence that the Ukrainians are perhaps shelling or using air power to strike inside of Russia? And for Marine, you showed a picture of a Russian tank. Well, was there any resistance to making that photograph? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and then just... Uh... And, and answer the question. There, there are some uh, reports that the uh, the Ukrainians have struck inside of Russia, some of the Russian supply depots and fuel dumps and those kind of things. Uh, there are also what look to be acts of sabotage across the border. Uh, the Ukrainians have been very coy about whether publicly acknowledging that they uh, they talk about these strikes as you know things that just have kind of happened fortuitously, uh, and I, obviously they're. Uh, I think they're playing the long game here and doing that. But it seems clear, I think, to U.S. and Western intelligence that if the uh, if the Ukrainians have the ability to carry out sabotage uh, against uh, these uh, kind of re these rearming and resupply areas that are not too far uh, inside of Russia from the Ukrainian border, the Ukrainians are taking that strike either from their special forces, their long range artillery, possibly some other aircraft, some drones. They've been very using some Turkish drones very effectively. Uh, so I think there is evidence that they are doing that, John. And Marini, we'd like to ask yeah. the question. It's very bright out, just trying to block that. Um, so I showed two images, the one with the woman walking past, with a bicycle walking past a tank, that is a Russian tank that was destroyed. And the tank that was driving was actually a Ukrainian tank. Um, part of the Ukrainian forces that, like I said, the Chernihiv had just been liberated. Um, they were not thrilled I made that image because everyone is very, um, everyone's nervous about spies and any information getting out and potentially aiding the Russians. Okay. So I didn't know which image you meant. But. I thought it was the one of the, uh, the tank moving, not the destroyed tank, but the tank moving. I thought it was a Russian tank, so. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. I, I have, I don't really care to get that close to Russians at this moment. So hopefully that doesn't, doesn't happen. Don't blame you. Thank you both, Eric and Marinette. Eric, we have another question from Michael Cohn. Could you unmute yourself and ask the question? Yeah, Eric, um, if the Ukrainians are lucky enough over the long haul to actually beat the Russians back, um, their country has been destroyed in so many different areas in so many ways. Have you heard any assessments out of Washington as to what it's going to take to rebuild the country? And uh, where do you think the money is going to come from? Uh, well, Marini may have heard some on the ground, but the estimates I've heard, uh, and this is coming from Ukrainians, it's in the hundreds of billions of dollars right now and, and you know, growing every day. And, uh, and Zelensky and the Ukrainians are doing a smart thing. They've already started, uh, you know, appealing to, uh, to countries individually. I know there's a, uh, Marini can maybe talk about our World Bank assessment. I think she's going to be working on shortly uh, that will try and get international uh, donors involved in that. Uh, we wrote a story last week, my colleagues on the ground, uh, about how the Ukrainians, in many cases, aren't waiting for this international aid. They're 
they're trying to rebuild some of these cities already, you know, clearing the rubble, trying to start uh, repaving roads, you know, cratered by uh, munitions, Russian munitions. Uh, so they're pushing ahead, not waiting for international aid, but the, the need will be uh, just huge. Yeah, I guess I can make a quick comment on two things. When when we were in Chernihiv, which is the destroyed city we showed, um, there was still imminent threat that a lot of people, there were whispers that you know Russia was gonna come back. It was just a momentary retreat. But uh, everyone that I talked to was like, we have a city to rebuild. Um, so they, they, they people were like the day, the two days after Russia had a re retreated after five weeks of occupation, people were already motivated to just start rebuilding their country. And I mentioned in the chat, um, I meant to mention when I was speaking earlier, but I'm going back to Ukraine next week. And one of the things that I'm doing is going to be helping with a needs assessment, specifically doing photo, video, and drone work in 10 of the um, hardest hit or most, most destroyed, physically destroyed cities to help do an assessment of like what is going to be needed financially and otherwise to rebuild Ukraine. I don't, I, I imagine it's going to be, you know, a lot of different efforts, but I don't have an, uh, an answer on all of the different players. Okay, I'd like to take a question from the chat from Colette Fournier um, for Eric. Uh, two questions here. What is NATO's current role in the war? And a very different question. What happened to the Africans who are trying to leave Ukraine when the war started? Um, I'll, I'll go in reverse order. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what happened to the Africans. I, my sense is from some of the reporting that I've seen uh, is that they eventually got out. They obviously faced uh, much more uh, difficult issues uh, at the border in trying to, to leave. Uh, not only Africans, but other Middle Easterns as well who were, who were there working or studying inside of Ukraine. And, and had to uh, and had to evacuate. I, I think at this point I haven't heard the same kind of issues that were uh, that were highlighted in the initial uh, weeks of the uh, of the evacuations uh, that would underscore their problem. I mean NATO is is uh, obviously the NATO and NATO countries because uh, it's both NATO and then the individual member states are are fully involved in this uh, right now. The individual countries are uh, are donating uh, weapons, ammunition. Uh, supplies uh, going forward. They're they're coordinating uh, with some of the uh, assistance going in. Uh, so it's 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 a major role right now. And of course, there's a there's somewhat of a danger in the promotion of these efforts because you know what 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 Putin is trying to do is is move the narrative away from a Russian invasion of Ukraine to a broader war that he frames for his people is. Russia against the United States and NATO. It's a false narrative, but that's the one he is trying to selling, uh, kind of again, making Russia be the aggrieved party uh, and, and, and kind of listing it as part of a long catalog of grievances uh, that he's had against the United States and the West since he took power 22 years ago. Um, Bruce Rosen has a question. Bruce, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? That may be left up. Oh, nope. Yes. Hi. Um, are either of the, the, you aware of any efforts um, to maintain critical contacts with the Russians? Um, I mean, we have to be working with them on climate. The Arctic Council, of which they were part of, was shut down to them. It's really very important climate wise. Plus, they are a critical integer in, in reviving the um, um, uh, Iran um, agreements. And those are just two elements. Um, and at some point in time, this has this is above and beyond the the obvious, you know, a, aggression. There are other things we have to work with them on. Do you have any sense? that there are alternative communications that are going on and there are some efforts in either direction to, to keep lines of communications open? Or do you think it's impossible? 
Well, I, I think uh, obviously the Russians have made it very difficult and there've been a number of initiatives in other areas that have been either curtailed or cut off altogether for the time being. I, I think there are some efforts in the scientific community that have been able to go forward even under the strains that the relationship has right now. Uh, it's, it's, it's gonna be difficult, but, but you underscore some of the most important ones, uh, the Iran nuclear deal and trying to push that through. Uh, with or without the Russians. I mean, there's an effort to just kind of cut them out of that process at this point. Uh, but otherwise, on, on climate change and things like that, I think there are, you know, some of the still the scientific exchanges that are going on and things. Uh, it's not an issue I cover uh, extensively in other areas, but um, but because certainly in the national security and foreign policy realm, it's um, most contacts have been cut. Even though the United States uh, makes clear they have established essentially kind of a hotline with the, uh, with the Russian military, the Pentagon has, similar to what they have with the Russians in Syria, um, to try and at least on a tactical and operational level, avoid uh, any kind of um, accidental uh, conflict or inter interference between the two, between the you know, Western country or, uh, or, or the Russians. May I, may I add one more thing on to that? It seems Russia being part of the, the grouping that was labeled the BRICS. The BRICS seem to be staying together. In fact, Lulu, who looks like he's going to be returning to the presidency um, in Brazil, is, is taking the Russian side um, in, in this. Um, do you have any sense of why that dynamic um, is there? Um, and, and what factor it may, may have in, in how things go, certainly for the Ukrainians? Well, I mentioned some of these countries and they're very prominent that are, are backing uh, Russia in, to some degree or another, including China, India, Brazil. Uh, you mentioned these. And in some, regard, in some ways it's because uh, Russia controls their energy supply. In, in China, you've got a long standing relationship, at least over the last several years between President Xi and President Putin that, that uh, fits into uh, President Xi's larger geostrategic aims. Um, so you've got a kind of combination of motivations why these countries, whether it's uh, because of arms sales, uh, energy sales, geodiplomatic issues uh, that they have uh, in terms of countering the United States as influence overall, global influence, uh, and you haven't seen that waiver too much, although the Chinese, I have to think, are having a little bit of buyer's remorse right now. I think they didn't think they were going to be getting to quite the, the pickle they are with Russia right now that they are. But uh, certainly from what you, we, my colleagues who follow that closely uh, are watching with, with, with Xi, he's not going to cut Moscow loose by any means. Um, but it's been interesting that he hasn't given them the kind of military support that they've requested from him. They're, the Chinese are being very, kind of very careful to try and play this uh, as they can, at least say they are trying to play their both sides on this. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Bruce. Um, we have a question from Kent Fairfield. Kent. Thank you. Uh, for Eric, uh, I'm wondering, is there, early on there was talk of some kind of conversations toward negotiations. Is there any vestige of any talks on negotiations for peace right now while the fighting is so terribly fierce and the division is so stark? You know, there have been teams that have been from both sides that have met to negotiate, but they're really, uh, at this point, it's a very low level team that the Russians are sending. Uh, the Ukrainians say they're, you know, they're negotiating in good faith, but to be honest, again, both both countries right now think they have an opportunity to win on the battlefield. And so I would say right now, there's really no uh, diplomatic initiative, uh, in, no imminent diplomatic initiative that I can see right now. Thanks. We have a question from Scott Hopkins. Oh, uh, thank you. And thanks for uh, this great uh, 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 Zoom meeting. Uh, so my question is, some people are calling this the TikTok war. And I'm just wondering, it seems like there's so now there's so many different social media and people trying to get the word out there and things. What do you think of this whole rivalry or whatever you want to call it between different forms of communication about the conflict? I don't know, Marini, you want to, you have any thoughts on that? Um, what you saw. 
Yeah, I mean, assuming it's not propaganda, I'm a big proponent of like on the ground reporting. Um, like we're, the propaganda being put out by Russia is an entirely different conversation, but the fact that someone in a part of Ukraine where I or any other journalist can't, are not or cannot even get to, if they're able to get the word out about the reality and the truth about what's happening on the ground, that is, to me, that's just, that's, a, that's good for everyone. Um, I don't have TikTok. I don't participate, like I don't use certain platforms, but again, I think it's just all about like on the ground reporting, getting facts out into the public so that the world knows what's happening in Ukraine. Thank you, thank you. All right, well, I don't see any other questions. Um, we're over five o'clock. Um, before we close, I'd like to invite Andrea Izaki from Digital Silver Imaging to say hello and say a few words. Andrea, are you out there in the audience? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me, Glenn? Hear you fine. Um, so I, I want to say thank you to Glenn and Social Documentary Network and to Marnie and Eric, of course, for that uh, a very informative uh, presentation. We're a fine art uh, print lab here in Boston, and we support a lot of documentary photographers. And uh, just watching this on my own personal note, I was thinking about kind of the importance of, uh, obviously the importance of what Eric does in informing us, but the enduring importance of what Marini does in creating the imagery. Um, it, it makes me think about, she mentioned the Vietnam War, and uh, I remember seeing that very famous Eddie Adams photograph in an exhibit. Uh, and on the back of that photograph were all the places that it was published. And uh, I would just like to see more of the imagery that Marini is creating like in the media, which would be great. Um, but I also think that uh, supporting uh, 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 SDN and uh, subscribing to Zeke is very important um, so, because the image in print, uh, obviously I have an interest, but I think it's, it's a big component of what makes us not forget uh, what has happened in the past. And so thank you. Thank you, Andrea. And um, before we close, I'd just like to remind people that if you'd like to support humanitarian efforts in Ukraine, uh, one of the most effective organizations on the ground right now is the World Central, Central Kitchen that Marini has worked with. And you can visit their website at wck.org um, to make a donation to specifically their Ukraine work. All right, I'd like to thank um, Marini and Eric and everybody else who's joined us today for this very lively program. And if you want to unmute yourself and just applaud the uh, speakers and join me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you, want me to answer, do you want me to answer call it really quickly or I can message yeah. her privately? Go for it. Um, okay, Marini has one more thing to. Uh, well, I, I just saw the question down there. Go for I, it. I, yeah, no, I'm an independent photographer. So I'm like, I guess, a staff member for the Times. I'm kind of either working for World Central Kitchen or um, another organization or pursuing stories on my own. And I think that's just, uh, I gave a talk yesterday about like, I gave a talk at my old high school actually about the different um, paths to journalism. And then there's two specific ones. I mean, there's many paths, but one is becoming a staff photographer or writer, et cetera. And the other is being independent. And so I went over there on my own and um, pieced together work for different outlets and different NGOs, and then also pursued um, things that were of personal interest or that I felt were important or that I was curious to learn more about. So there is no like average day necessarily. Thank you, interesting, yeah. yeah. All right, thanks again, everybody. Hope to Take see care. you. At the next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Beautiful job, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.